Hello everybody, my name is Raymond Jett with ArcadeComponents.com and this is the first video in a series of videos I'll be doing on circuit basics for arcade games and uh, vintage computers. So for those of you that want to learn a bit more about how the various circuits work inside of a computer, uh, stay tuned and uh, keep an eye out on this channel for further videos. But today we're going to start with one of the basic blocks that's required and that's the reset circuit. So we've got a quick agenda for you. We're going to look at why are they important. Then we're going to get started in, into looking at the circuits. We're going to look at some example circuits and then we're going to go through troubleshooting steps for the circuits. So why are reset circuits important? Well, there's a few reasons. The first and foremost, power supplies are dirty when they start up. They need time to stabilize, they need time, and it's just milliseconds. I mean, it's just really, really fast how quickly they come from zero up to the five volts necessary for your logic to run. But that's still, that's, that's a long time in CPU cycles. And the clock signals as the power comes up also need to stabilize. And when you first turn on the CPU, it's going to power up in an unknown state. The registers, instruction pointer, program counters, interrupts, etc. It's all a scrambled jumbled mess. You know, it's like human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. No, uh, order needs to be brought to that chaos. So the reset circuit's going to do that. Its job is to hit the CPU over the head, bonk, and get it started up in an orderly fashion so that it can start running code. Now we're just talking in generalities here, you know, because different CPUs have different things that happen on power up. And yeah, there are edge cases where one particular one may start up in a known state, but generally you need the reset circuit. You need a power on reset signal to start them up and get them to do what they need to do. So what does this reset circuit do? Just the absolute basics. It just causes the CPU to initialize itself into a known state. The registers are set to a specific state, interrupts are cleared, and the CPU is going to go grab instructions out of memory, and it's going to start executing them. Now, different CPUs do this in a different way, and without the reset circuit, some CPUs may actually appear to be totally dead with no activity on the data lines and randomness on the address lines, like a Z80, for example. But right now we know that it starts, but where does it start at? So we know it causes the CPU to come up and start in that specific area of memory, but it's going to depend on the CPU. If you have a Z80, it's going to start the execution at the base of memory at address zero. Uh, if you have a 6502, it's going to grab a reset vector for memory. That's just an address. It's going to grab bytes at the address at FFFC and FFFD, you know, at the very top of memory. And it's going to put them together and do a jump to that address. Similar for the 6809, just a slightly different address for it to jump to. The 68000 is a little bit different, but it's still very similar. It's going to grab bytes and put them into the supervisor stack pointer. It's going to grab some bytes at address 4, stuff them into the program counter, then initialize the interrupt level, and then it's going to jump to that address that's in the program counter and start executing the code that's in the ROMs. Now, we know we need a reset signal, but how long of a reset signal do we need? And, and what is this about reset and slash reset or reset with a bar over top of it. Well, that just determines on what type of reset signal you have. So if you have just simply reset with no lines or slashes or bars, that just simply means it's an active high signal. So the reset line is normally going to be low, zero volts or below 0.8 volts, a logic zero, and it's going to pulse high. It's going to pulse up over two point, uh, I forget the exact number. I've got another slide here, volts to logic high it's over two point something volts and it's going to pulse for a specific amount of time and then drop back down back to normal now the slash reset means it's an active low so normally the reset line is going to be high uh, this is what the z80 is going to use it's going to be an active high so normally it's five volts when you first turn it on your logic probe will show a, a quick flash of low then high and that's the power on reset working to get that CPU into its known state. Now, how long it depends on the CPU. 
uh, for the Z80, 6502, 6809, etc. It can be as short as 50 milliseconds, but if you want to uh, do the 68,000, uh, the Freescale data sheet says it should be 100 milliseconds in duration. Now, let's take a look at some example circuits. The simplest one is going to be an RC circuit, a resistor and a capacitor. The resistor limits the uh, flow of current into the capacitor, and that just determines how long a time it's going to take to charge that capacitor up to the voltage that's coming in. So you have the size of the capacitor and the size of the resistor determining that time circuit. It's a bit problematic because there's this no man's land in the middle of logic. So if you look at your TTL input signal levels, you, uh, I've got it here on the slide. You can see where it's 0.8 volts and below for low, 2 volts and up for high for the input on a TTL gate. So you can consider your reset as similar on the CPU. But there's an area between that 0.8 and 2 volts where you have some unpredictability. And so you might have a CPU that bounces, you know, just kind of acts like it's gotten reset multiple times real fast uh, based on that invalid voltage range. So the solution to this, and you'll see this in schematics, is to add a Schmidt trigger or two to square up the output. Now, Schmidt trigger just simply has a bit of hysteresis in it to where as that voltage level comes up and passes that point of being low, it snaps the output to the logic state uh, the, instead of being there in the middle. Now, these are typically inverters, 74LS14 or 74HC14, 74HCT14 or an S14. So being inverters, that's why you might want to add two in there. So if you have a reset circuit that starts low and goes high and you put an inverter on it, well, now you've got a reset circuit that starts high and goes low. And that would be invalid for a Z80, for example, which is an active low signal, so you would use two of the Schmidt triggers so that you get the output that you want. A reset signal that starts low and then snaps to high so that the CPU can start and run. Now another example circuit is a 555 timer. This chip has been around since the 70s. It's a very robust chip. Uh, you can power it well above 5 volts and it just it runs. I've rarely ever see these fail. And they operate in a standard one-shot mode or mode where they just keep repeating a signal. So in a reset circuit, you're going to use it in a one-shot because you want to fire off that reset signal one time on power on and have it operate. Now with this, it's going to give you an output that is uh, that pulses high and we need an output that pulses low for the Z80, so they added a 74LS04 to invert that output. That's an inverter, kind of like the LS14, but without the hysteresis, without the Schmidt trigger portion. And this schematic that you see on the screen is from the arcade game Mr. Do. Now you'll find that others have reset controller ICs. Now reset controller ICs are a bit different in that they do give you that initial pulse for reset on startup, but they also watch the input voltage. And if they see the voltage dropping too low, then they will issue a reset signal to the CPU to restart it. So if you're working with a computer and it periodically restarts and you have these types of circuits in it, then one of the things you could do is look to see, is my voltage dropping? If it is, then the, these reset controller ICs are going to bunk the CPU over the head and have it restart. Now, the one that you'll see in a, a three-pin terminal configuration, like a PST518A, these are commonly used in the Neo Geo series of arcade game boards. You know, you've got the various one slots and two slots, four slots, and a six-slot version of that game. And they'll use these to do that initial power on reset. The MB3771 from Fujitsu is similar in operation, but it's in an 8-pin dip package. And you can do uh, additional things with it as well, such as watching a second voltage line and uh, having uh, reset buttons added in, things like that. It's, it's, a, it's a robust chip. And don't let the name Fujitsu scare you because I, I have yet to see one of these things fail, like the Fujitsu Logic chips that, you, that you'll 
uh, hear people talk about where you, you have lots of dead gates. Um, this one is similar in, in that if the voltage level drops below 4.2 volts, it'll bonk that CPU over the head again. Now, a watchdog circuit is a circuit that just, as the name implies, it's a watchdog. It keeps an eye over the CPU. Now, the CPU, what it does is every once in a while, it will go out and it will reset a particular logic line that will keep that watchdog from hitting the reset line. So here we can see we have V-blank coming in and then we have a watchdog reset line coming in. The CPU periodically will clear that out so that it does not trigger a reset of the CPU. Now, what happens is if your CPU goes off into La La Land, the watchdog reset will go out, bonk it on the head, and cause it to start over. So if you have something that keeps resetting over and over and over again, then you've got a problem somewhere else in the circuitry. And we're going to talk about that in a future video because the watchdog circuit is kind of its, its own full topic. The big thing to realize is, is if your watchdog is kicking off, then you've got a problem somewhere in there. Bad memory, bad ROMs, bus problems. But again, we'll touch more on that in a later video. And this particular schematic with the power on reset and the watchdog is from Galaga. You're very familiar with that arcade game. So let's look at a little bit of troubleshooting. Now, I am a big proponent of using a logic probe that has an audio beep function. That audio beep function can tell you so much more than some blinking lights because you'll hear differences in gates. If you have a gate that's barely hitting the logic high and uh, it's, it's causing problems, you know, weak gates, you'll hear scratchy sounds coming from the logic probe. You'll actually hear a difference in how that sounds. Now, I've got another video out on, on my channel that talks about how to use that logic probe in troubleshooting audio circuits on a Neo Geo board. You've got a digital to analog converter that comes from the Yamaha YM2610 chip. It's the uh, YM20, uh, is it 3016? Uh, anyway, it's a little uh, 16 pin, 14 or 16 pin chip. You, you put your logic probe on the output of the uh, Yamaha chip or the input at the DAC, and you'll hear just a standard beep, beep, beep. But when the audio comes to it in the digital forms, you'll hear a beep, beep. You'll hear a scratchy sound of that digital audio making it to that DAC. And that lets you know that, hey, my digital side of that circuit is working. My no sound issue, I need to further look into the analog section of that sound. And when you're dealing with reset circuits, it's very easy to hear that transition from the low beep to the high beep when you're doing the power on reset or you push the reset button. And it's also easier when you're keeping an eye on what's happening on the screen or what's happening on your power supply to just keep your ear tuned to what the logic probe is telling you. Now, if you have something that's too short to see with the logic probe, it's probably going to be too short to see uh, to properly reset that CPU. So when, when you're looking at that power on reset, you'll see a momentary low, and then it comes back up to high if it's an active low. It'll be momentarily, it'll be high then um, momentarily, oh, low then momentarily high, going back to low if it's an active high. But listen to that audio and you'll, you'll, you can really hear the difference in the circuits. Now, if you're using a, an oscilloscope, you can see the reset pulse, but the problem is, is this a single pulse? So it's going to just flash on the screen and disappear because you know, you're you're sitting there, you've got the trigger going, and boom, you'll you'll just see a flash on the screen, and and pretty much that's it. But if you have a, a, a scope that can do capturing of waveforms, then you'll want to log or capture that waveform so that you can see it on the screen longer. Uh, this is where a logic probe or logic analyzer is actually going to be better for troubleshooting than an oscilloscope when you're dealing with these types of circuits. Now, if your reset circuit isn't working, if it doesn't have a pulse, always start with your senses, your eyes specifically. Look for damage. I can't tell you how many arcade game boards I've repaired over the years where 
I go in and I look at it, it's not starting up, the reset circuit's stuck, and I look at the capacitor that is next to the reset circuit, and you'll see the capacitor bent over with one leg partially pulled out of it. Because operators just throw boards in boxes and bends, and they just get beat to heck. So you replace the cap, boom, should be back in working order. Also look for broken resistors, look for gouge traces or broken traces, uh, and corrosion as well, because we all know that spilled drinks and rodent damage on game boards is really hard to deal with. Similar with your vintage computers. If you have an Apple II, make sure you don't have a mouse nest inside it. You know, there's, those types of things will cause a lot of problems with traces. The reset circuits, if you have the reset controller, check your five volts level. Make sure it's, it's good coming from that power supply. Uh, perhaps you have a faulty IC. It's rare. Uh, most likely you're going to have power level problems or a broken cap or something like that. Uh, the reset circuits, you'll still have caps around those as well. So make sure you check those. And like I said, we'll, we'll look at watchdog issues in another video. Because if you have a, a reset circuit that just keeps on being hammered and your logic probe is sitting there going beep, 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 beep. Or that reset circuit keep getting hit over and over again. That's a watchdog issue. And we'll discuss that later. So things to remember when dealing with reset circuits your power and your clocks need time to stabilize. And this reset pulse keeps that CPU locked in place for that duration. And then when the reset pulse disappears, the CPU initializes in that orderly fashion so it can start running code and doing what it's supposed to do. That reset circuit will come in many different forms, but they all serve the same purpose of bonking that CPU over the head and getting it to start in an orderly fashion. Now, I recommend the Logic Probe with audio. If you're troubleshooting a reset circuit, uh, they're a lot easier to use than oscilloscopes and much easier to use when you're wanting to uh, check a single reset pulse. You also have a memory function on most of your Logic Probes. You can flip that turn it on and then your memory light will light up if that pulse is a bit too short for you to see on the uh, LEDs. Uh, you can still pretty much hear it with the audio function even if it's uh, the flashing to the lights too fast for you to see. And I use my Logic Pro most of the time when doing these types of repairs because uh, it's once you learn what it's telling you it will become your go-to tool. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, please subscribe, hit the bell. We're going to go with many more videos in this series. I have a link I'll put in the description to the Aussie Arcade Forum where I have a post out there about this series. Uh, I'm taking those posts and turning them into these videos. Thank you for your time.